My name is Addison Martin, and I am the graduate student coordinator for the LAP Speaker Series, where we host remarkable people in and adjacent to the professions of landscape architecture and environmental planning. We would like to acknowledge this, that as a land-grant institution, Utah State University campuses and centers reside and operate on the territories of the eight tribes of Utah. The Logan campus is situated in the Sivagoy, or Willow Valley, the ancestral lands of the northwestern band of the Shoshone Nation, where Shoshone people have stewarded the land since time immemorial and continue to live today. We acknowledge these lands carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. We affirm indigenous self-governance history, experiences, and the resiliency of the native people who are still here today. For our event today, we are honored to be hosting the Distinguished Alumni Lecture, and as many of you know, the Advancement Board um, is here with us today. With the posters now up, you may be wondering how rhythm ties into all of this. For those who have already taken Carolyn's theory of design, this should ring a bell, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> if we did our job. Rhythm organizes structures and sets elements into motion, creating a sense of harmony and connection. The exemplary work we see in our profession enacts rhythm amongst the differing use cases, parameters, and design elements. Keep this in the back of your mind as each of the speakers this semester uh, share with us, asking yourself how might they be exemplifying this notion of rhythm in their own practice. As a general overview for the flow of this program, first we'll hear from our speaker, and then that will be immediately followed by a Q&A. Um, and then we will move up to the common studio for a social with refreshments. Before we get any fur further, please keep in mind to receive course credit for attending. The window to submit your A number um, and course information will become available after the brief Q&A. Um, and Deandra in the black shirt today will be able to help with any troubleshooting issues at that time. Okay. This afternoon, we have the special treat of hearing from the, the founding partner of LOSI, an award-winning landscape architecture, land planning, urban design firm that tackles a wide range, um, sorry, a wide range of project types and skills from urban design, resorts, institutions, parks and open space, neighborhood and community planning, mixed use development, and private residences. This diverse range of projects has taken their work into over 38 different countries and six different continents. Having received his bachelor's in landscape architecture here at USU, Michael Budge brings nearly 20 years of innovative site design to his practice in Salt Lake City and fervently believes that dissecting what you find to be inspirational is, in is integral to any individual's approach to practice. Known for a unique synthesis of conceptual rigor, technical know-how, and an unsurpassed attention to detail, his design extracts influences from, uh, extract influences from the site and surrounding context to create outdoor spaces with a simple and clear aesthetic that have won recognition on both local and national stages. Here with us today, we have his family, we have his parents, um, maybe even his sister um, up here. Um, and it's just wonderful to have them all here. We have quite the legacy, the budge legacy here at Utah State. Please give a warm welcome to our distinguished alumni, Michael Budge. Thanks, thanks for having me here. I'm excited to be here. I will say it's really weird being on this side of the room though. <laughs> I've been coming up to these lectures um, for years. First as a student, like many of you, and then as a professional, I've been, my, my office and I have been coming to these for years, and it's, it's really weird being on this side of, of the auditorium. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm nervous to be here, to be honest with you, probably because uh, I know so many of you. Um, I wish I was given this lecture at a different university where I didn't know anybody. <laughs> um, I don't think I'd be as nervous as I am now. I know, that's the, that's the problem. No, I was kidding. Um, you might go, you might leave this room stupider than you, than when you came here, but um, no, I'm excited to be here. Um, it's like coming home in, in a lot of ways. Uh, many of you know my dad was a professor here at Utah State for 37 years, and he was actually a professor in this very department. And so when I say it's like coming home, I, I mean that quite literally. I've been coming to this building my entire life. Um, I remember chasing my brothers up and down these ramps, um, playing tag in the hallways, 
My dad used to roll out pieces of paper in the faculty lounge, let me draw as a small kid. Um, I used to play on the student models with my G.I. Joe characters and <laughs> things like that. So when I say it's, it's like coming home, it, it really is like that for me. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity over the years uh, to meet with several students and uh, both from being in the advancement board, uh, get the opportunity to interact with you guys on, a, on multiple levels. Um, I've also had the opportunity just as an employer to, to interview a lot of you. Um, and there's one thing that uh, I like to ask when I, when I talk to students is where do you get your influence? Um, where do you get inspired? How do you get inspired? And, you know, sometimes I get some pretty good responses. But most of the time, if I'm honest, I kind of get a blank stare. And it goes kind of quiet on the other side of the table. And that's what I'd like to talk to you guys today about, is the importance, about, uh, the importance of finding inspiration and using that inspiration in our, in our work. So I've titled my lecture today, Under the Influence. And I hope as I go through this that uh, it'll start to become very clear what I mean. So how do you find inspiration? How do you implement that inspiration in your work? And then how do you use that to influence others? Those are the three things I'd like to talk to you uh, about today. Why, why, does it, why does finding inspiration matter? Finding inspiration matters because it starts to give your, your designs purpose. Um, it starts to give your designs meaning. And that is everything. Um, I would argue that when a design has purpose and it has meaning, you can actually feel it. Um, there's a common phrase that we use a lot, spirit of the place. I honestly, honestly believe that. I feel like I can, I can say that all of us have been to a space that was built and designed where it had an impact on you. You felt something. Um, and I would say that the reason you feel something is because whatever the moves were to create that space uh, was done with intent, was done with meaning and purpose. Um, I think we've all seen situations like this, right, on the left-hand side. We've also all seen spaces like this on the right. This is what I'm talking about. There's times where things get done with no thought given behind it. Um, whereas on the right, when you visit a place like this, hopefully the meaning, um, the expression, the intent is felt as you, as, as you experience a place like this. Many of you in this room might recognize this guy. This is Dick Toth. Uh, Dick Toth was a professor at, at Utah State here in this department. And uh, one of my biggest regrets as a student is I never, never had the opportunity to take one of his classes. He actually uh, left the department the year I, was, I came to Utah State. So I never actually got a, to, to have a lesson uh, by Dick, but my brother did. And he tells the story of him sitting at his desk up in the studios up there. And he was getting a desk crit. And Dick Toth was walking around the, the studio. He was looking over my brother's shoulder, watching him work. And my brother kind of made a move on the page. And Dick stopped him. And he asked the question, why did you do that? And Terrell kind of was like, kind of perplexed by the, the question. And he said, I don't know, I just, I think it looks cool, you know? And Dick, Dick went on to continue to say, every line you make on a page needs to have meaning, should have purpose. There should be a reason why you've made that, that move. And that, honestly, has had a huge impact on my life. It didn't come directly from Dick to me, but it came through, uh, through my brother. And I still approach my projects and my design process with that in mind, that every move you make on the page, everything that you do should have purpose, should have meaning. We shouldn't just do arbitrary things just to do them. 
uh, because they lack meaning, they lack intent. Let's try to be more intent uh, on what we're doing. Um, so where do you go for inspiration? Um, I would say the first thing we need to do is we need to start looking around. We need to start being students of place. We need to start observing and seeing the areas in which we're surrounded by. I would say that if all of us were to get up right now, leave the auditorium, go out into the plaza out in front of this building here, and we sat down and started observing this, that area, you would start to see things that you'd never seen before. You guys have probably walked through that plaza a hundred times. But I, uh, I, I honestly believe that if you sat down and you started looking at things and analyzing it, you're gonna start seeing stuff that you've never seen. You're gonna see, start seeing details that you never noticed before. You're gonna start seeing textures. You're gonna start seeing how things were put together. And there's a lot uh, to learn from just observing. So we need to be students of place. You need to start asking yourselves as you do this, why do I like this more than that? Why does this area feel better than that area? And just start observing. I threw this picture in here because this is, this is my dad. Um, this, is, this is my childhood right here. <laughs> my whole life I've been watching this man observe. Um, not knowing what he was doing, but my, my brothers and my sister and I, we always used to make fun of him because he, he always would just stand there like this and he just, he always has this like thing with his face, I guess, but he's always just standing there looking at stuff. You can almost literally see the hamster wheel turning in the head, right? And, and he, he does this still to this very day. He'll go to a location, you can just see him thinking about stuff. He taught construction details here at Utah State and I would, I would see him on our family trips just analyzing everywhere we went. And our family trips, I, I've come to learn, were quite unique. My dad being a professor here at Utah State, we had long summer breaks, right? So we'd go on these epic road trips where we'd go to Chicago, we'd go to Seattle, we'd go to San Francisco. And the funny thing is, is <laughs> you know how when you get back to school, and teachers are like, hey, how was your supper break? Tell us a little bit about what you did. You know, you get, I'd get classmates that are like, I went to Disneyland, I went to Hawaii. And then they'd come to me and I'm like, I went to a plaza, <laughs> you know? I went, to a, I went to look at parks. And you'd get, you'd, the teacher would get that expression of like, you did what, you know? But that's what, I, that's what I grew up doing, is visiting plazas, visiting streets, visiting parks watching my dad observe and look at the spaces around him. Now, one of the best ways to train yourself to see is by drawing. This is a sketch from my dad, it's a little pixelated. I had to take a picture of it through uh, a picture on, the, uh, on my kitchen wall. But one of the best ways we can train ourselves to see is through drawing. And why is that? When you draw, you have to pay attention, right? You have to pay attention to the details. You have to pay attention to the relationships of one thing to another. You need to, you start to see tone, depth, texture, light, all of, all of those things. You start seeing design principles, scale, rhythm, balance, all of those things start to come into your focus. And the interesting thing is, is that when you do this over and over again, your ability to see gets better. Your vision actually starts to increase. And you start to see things that you never saw before. So we need to be, we need to analyze, analyze space. We need to, again, be students of place. Um, Emerson said this, he says, that in which we persist in doing gets easier. Not that the nature of the thing changes, but that your power to do that thing increases. And I love that. 
what he's essentially saying there is that if we do this over and over again, right? If we go out and we force ourselves to look and to observe and to see, the easier it becomes over time. And I know that to be a, a true principle. Um, until eventually it becomes who you are. It becomes a part of you. Now this, this uh, going out and observing is not a new thing, right? We've been doing that from the beginning of time. But, you know, this was something that architects and artists have been doing as far back as the 1600s. They actually called it the Grand Tour. And it often uh, consisted of taking out from England, getting on a sa sailing across the English Channel, arriving in France, you'd get on a carriage, take a carriage ride through the French countryside, and you'd arrive at Paris. And you'd spend some time at Paris, in Paris, and then you'd work your way up into Italy, and you would visit places like Rome, Florence, Milan, Venice, and it, these, these grand tours would last a year or more. And what they would do is they'd do just that. They'd go visit the plazas and the architecture and the art and the sculpture, and they'd observe the relationships between one another, the textures. They took notebooks, they would sketch, they would draw. They'd start paying attention to the details, start recognizing the things that they were inspired by. Probably would take some notes about things that they didn't like. Um, but they did this for a year, um, just going and analyzing and looking at how things were connected one with one another. And then they'd take these things that they learned, obviously, back to their homeland or wherever they came from, and tried to implement it into the, pre the things that they were doing. The difference is today is that we have an enormous amount of information at our fingertips. Never in the history of mankind have we ever had this amount of information readily available to us. We can go on the internet in a matter of minutes. We can probably see more and experience more um, than they ever did in an evening that took them almost a year uh, to go see, right? Because we have this enormous amount of information just handed to us. Um, and there's all of these different platforms that we can go to in order to get inspired. Which is amazing. It's absolutely phenomenal that we can do this. I mean, I sound like an old, old fart when I say this, but like, this kind of stuff wasn't even available when I started, you know. Like, yes, the internet was around, but it's amazing the information that's starting to just become readily available. Google Earth, for instance, you know, you can, we can, you can fly in Google Earth all the way into these plazas and uh, pan around when you get in there and see everything that they saw, right? We as an office do this all the time. On every project that we get, that we, get we get into Google Earth and we fly around, try to learn from its context. Um, and it's just, it's incredible what kind of resources we have. But, as amazing as those resources are, they never substitute visiting a place in, in real life, right? You can look at an image like this of Bryant Park in New York, and it can be inspiring. And there's a lot of things you can learn just by staring at this image, no doubt about it. But it doesn't substitute being there in person. When you're there in person, you know, the picture doesn't tell you how tall the buildings are. In front of you, behind you, it doesn't tell you, there's, there's more to what we do in placemaking than just seeing. It's all the senses, right? It's touch, it's feel, it's hearing. So when you experience a place, you feel the sun, you feel the sh shade, you feel the grass under your feet, you feel the crunch of the decomposed granite under your feet, you hear the people arguing, laughing, fighting. Um, you hear the, the sound of the cars. Um, 
that's what placemaking is really about, is, is touching on all the senses. So there's no substitute for actually going and experiencing things. So we as an office, we, we take this into our practice. We like to do these little miniature grand tours, if you will. We identify locations of interest to us. And you know, every other year or so, we try to go out and visit these places. A lot of times they're associated with projects that we're, we're working on. I love this. <laughs> Look at these poses, right? But we go out and we, we go and we identify certain areas that we want to study. And we, look at that. Look at me, I'm oohing and on or something over there. But uh, yeah, we go and visit places and we have a good time studying and exploring uh, and looking at details. This is Glenn Stone in Washington, D.C. David there, he's been, he's been working on decks for years in our office, it feels like. And, here we are staring at how this deck was put together, Peter Walker work, you know, and analyzing how, how things need to be crafted. But yeah, we like to go out, we like to study our environment and see if we can learn from it. It doesn't always have to be a built environment either. Um, sometimes our best inspiration can come from nature. And uh, this is one of my favorite places on earth. Some of you might recognize it, Island Park. Um, just outside of Yellowstone. At this time, you know, we were designing the water course at daybreak, which has a lot of natural edges and so forth. And so trying to draw some inspiration, but also having a good time about what, what, what does a natural edge and water condition look like. But more importantly, in, in some ways, is we actually go out and we start evaluating our own work and we try to learn from the mistakes that we made, which are many, <laughs> but there's also a lot of good as well. But we like to go out and we like to visit some of the things that we've been working on and producing and analyzing it. What worked well, what didn't work well, what, what materials hold up, what materials break down, should we be using that anymore um, as we move forward? Um, so we're always trying to learn from our own mistakes as well as mistakes from others. Uh, but we like to go out. I think he's had a long day. Dallin's obviously checked out. <laughs> but, uh, but I want you to pay attention to this, uh, this line here. Your output is only as good as your input. And I honestly believe that. Your output will only be as good as your input. We are products of our environment. Whatever you're taking in is what's gonna be coming out, right? So we've gotta, we've gotta create a library of influences. We've gotta create uh, a library of things that inspire you so that you can pull from them when the time comes. So you might ask the question, I'm gonna go back to this real quick. You might ask the question, Mike, why do, you, why do I need to draw, right? I've got, I've got the computer and uh, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna do my work in the computer, right? <laughs> Drawing's not important anymore. I would argue that's not true. Drawing is incredibly important, but I also recognize that computer and technologically things have advanced to a point where I mean, we in our office, we jump into the computer way earlier than we ever used to. And we are starting to produce things in the computer. And this, this isn't maybe the best graphic to illustrate the point. But I would argue that the individuals that create this kind of a rendering versus this rendering are the individuals that have learned how to see. These are the individuals that have learned through observation light, balance, rhythm, texture, all of those kind of things, right? Not all Lumion renderings are created equal, right? We, we've, all these, I can guarantee, we've all seen it, right? Some people are just able to produce an amazing rendering where others struggle. And yes, there might be some, you know, some technological advances and stuff that, 
But I would argue that the individuals that know how to do it right are the individuals that have learned how to know what they're looking for to create great work, okay? So, let me catch up here on my notes. There's also, um, there's another way. I keep my eye on the time here. Um, there's another way that we need to learn uh, to get inspiration. And that, I would say, is to emulate those uh, that inspire you. Kobe Bryant said this. He says, there isn't a move that isn't a new move. Did I read that right? There isn't a move that's a new move. Basically, what he was saying is that his whole career, he, he learned from his heroes. And every move that he ever made on the basketball court was an imitation or he was copying people that went on before. Right, and then as the as the text says there, you know he he learned early that he didn't have the same body type as some of the people he was trying to emulate, so he had to kind of twist it and make it his own. I would argue that design is exactly the same thing. Okay, you've got to emulate people that inspire you, and then over time you can start to make and create your own moves. There's a phrase, you know, a lot of times in landscape architecture, we talk of it as a discipline or a practice. Um, why do we use those terms? Why do we use the term discipline and practice? It's because that's exactly what it is. This, this profession requires a discipline. It requires an enormous amount of practice. That's why it's an old man's game. Have you ever noticed that those that are the best at what they do in this profession in architecture are typically old guys? Have you ever noticed that? It's very, very rare that you get a Bjork Ingalls or someone that just kind of comes onto the scene as a young person. Why? Because it takes years and years of practice, years and years of discipline until you really start to understand what it takes to do, to do great work. Nobody is born talking. We don't come out of the womb knowing who we are. In the beginning, we learn by pretending to be our heroes. We learn by copying. Now we're not talking about, we're talking about practice here, not plagiarism. Plagiarism is when you're trying to pass someone else's work off as your own. Copying is about reverse engineering, okay? So, This, is, this has been going on, this is how we learn anything, right? Is we copy other people. Um, we copy our heroes. <clears throat> Start copying what you love, copy, 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 and at the end of copying, you will find yourself. And I honestly believe this to be true. We've gotta emulate those that inspire us. We've gotta find our inspiration and start to copy it and reproduce it in our work. And through that process, you will start to find who, what you are as a designer. You'll start to find the things that make, you inter uh, make it interesting to you. Every new idea is just a mashup and a remix of one, another, uh, of one or more previous ideas. Remember, the Beatles started as a cover band, right? Isn't that interesting to think about? Think about that process that they had to have gone through, right? They first started off mimicking and copying the people that they looked up to. And then over time, I'm just guessing, but over time as they went through it, they started hearing things themselves that were like, if I tweaked it just a little bit, if I changed this a little bit, then it becomes their own. And I would say the design is exactly the same thing. So. Who are your heroes? Who are the people that are influencing you? And again, when I ask that question to people, where do you get inspired? And I get those blank stares, that's really concerning to me. Um, my goal for you guys is by the time you leave this place, Utah State that is, when someone asks you where, I get, where do you get inspired, you should be able to just rifle off a huge list of people that inspire you or places that inspire you. 
Um, I mean, this should just come off your tongue as fast as possible. So who are my influences? Frank Lloyd Wright, obviously. I think every designer starts with this guy. The thing that's funny about him, to be honest with you, is he claims he wasn't influenced by anybody, right? Frank Lloyd Wright was always like, I, I came up with everything on my own kind of attitude. But the fact is, this is a knock of, knockoff of Japanese architecture, right? Frank Lloyd Wright used to go to, he traveled to Asia when he was younger, he come back. He came back to America, where people didn't, where he thought people didn't know what they did over there, and he totally ripped off the Japanese. <laughs> he totally did. Totally did. The thing that's interesting, though, is he he ripped off the Japanese, but he put his own twist on it and called it Prairie Style. Right? If you look closely at his work, it is absolutely a knockoff of Japanese architecture. Mies. Mies is the man. This guy probably has influenced me more than anybody in my career. Mies was the master of details, the master of paying attention to uh, his surroundings. Ando. Ando, I think, is the master of simplicity and doing things in the least amount of moves possible to make an impact. Meyer. Meyer is amazing. Neutra. Philip Johnson. Thing about Philip Johnson, he openly admits this, he was the biggest copycat of all. Everything he ever did was a copy of someone else's work. Um, he wasn't a trained architect originally. Um, he had, later on in his life, I think he was 45, when he went back to school to become an architect, um, everything he did was literally an imitation of someone else he studied from. For instance, the glass house. This is probably his best known work. Um, this is an absolute ripoff of Mies van der Rohe's Farnsworth house. And he openly admits it. He was working with, he worked with Mies van der Rohe uh, when they were designing the Seagram building in Chicago. At the time, the Farnsworth family hired Mies to design a house and Mies started designing the Farnsworth house. And Philip totally knocked it off and said, Mies, you're gonna do yours in white, and it's gonna be elevated off the land. I'm gonna do mine in black, and I'm gonna plant it in the land. And so he used the same details, the same inspiration, but he made it his own and um, tweaked it a little bit. Peter Zumthor, I'm just gonna go through these quick, because um, we got still a lot to go through. <laughs> um, Thomas Pfeiffer. This is Glenstone, just outside of Washington, D.C. Probably my favorite built environment I've ever been to in my life. Um, absolutely perfection, in my opinion. Um, Thomas Pfeiffer was the architect. Uh, Peter Walker was the landscape architect. And when those two came together, it was like the angels were, you know, right? absolutely perfection. Tom Kundig, um, architect out of Seattle. He grew up in eastern Washington, northern Idaho, in kind of an industrial um, city where there was a lot of steel fabrication and stuff going on. And he got influenced by steel fabrication and so forth. And you can see it in his work where he got his inspiration. All of his architecture has these kind of gizmos and gadgets. And it was all inspired by his upbringing and where he came from. Jim Olson, Rick Joy, Logan, Eric Logan, landscape architects, Halperin. If you look at the plaza, if you look at the plaza outside the student union building, you know, with the water running down and everything, that was designed by that guy right there. And Craig Johnson, I don't know this for a fact, but I would say that they were ripping off this guy, <laughs> right? They were, they were stealing inform ideas from this guy who probably stole some ideas from whoever he was inspired by, right? Freeway Park. This place probably had more impact on my life than anywhere. This was one of our family trips. Went to Seattle, went and visited this place. That was my vacation, right? Is to go visit this place. I was probably 10 years old when we were here. And I kid you not, I was so blown away by it 
as a 10 year old that I told my parents, I said, I'm gonna be homeless and I'm gonna live here. <laughs> and I was like, I was absolutely serious. I was dead serious. I was making my plans already. I'm gonna be a homeless person. Not to, rip, you know, I know that's a sensitive topic, but I was gonna be homeless. I wanted to live in Freeway Park. Dan Kiley, I'll go through these quick. Andrea Cochran, George Hargraves, uh, Jim Burnett, who by the way is the next speaker in the speaker series, which is gonna be fantastic. Um, Catherine Gustafsson, uh, Lori Olin, Schwartz, Walker, Walker again. The thing is, is it doesn't always have to be built environments either. Um, I'm a furniture nut, so much so that I consider being an interior designer for a while. Um, I love furniture. I don't know what it is, but I just love furniture. This chair here probably had more influence on me than any. These two chairs were in Dick Toth's office, just right up here. And again, little kid, I saw these in his office, didn't know anything about them, but they blew me away as a kid. I was just like, these are the coolest things ever. Come to find out more of their backstory and it's, it, it's incredible, but I love this chair. Richard Serra, Andy Goldsworthy, Terrell, Rothko. These are all things that just blow my mind. Kenna. The other places, you know, I heard an awe right there. <laughs> the Wind Rivers, right? Um, doesn't always have to be artists and architects. We can be inspired by place. Wind Rivers, some of these guys here went into the winds with me a few years ago. We went to this very spot, actually, if you remember. <laughs> uh, Yellowstone, Island Park. Ireland has a place in my heart. Porsche, come on. <laughs> this, this is hands down the best design on the planet. Hands down, there's nothing better. This right here hits all the senses. Sight, sound, smell, texture, I mean you name it, this is it right here. Best design that man has ever put on the planet. U2, favorite band. These guys are about to embark on probably the best concert in the world starting next Friday in Las Vegas at the Sphere. Um, chef's table. We joke about this. My wife makes fun of me because I don't cook. I, I never cook, but I watch cooking shows like crazy. She just, she just thinks it's really weird, but they're inspiring to me. So much so that we, we've watched episodes at our office um, that have actually, and I'll talk about it in a minute, have actually had pretty profound impacts on how we look at things in landscape architecture. Okay, so let me catch up here. Why, why are these guys, why have these guys made in, uh, an impact in my life? Um, all of these individuals, especially the ones at the front, the designers, um, all of them put purpose and meaning into their work. All of them seek after excellence. Their entire lives have been de dedicated to doing quality and to, to, to do their craft at the highest level. And that's what's always been so inspiring to me. There's no secret formula for becoming known. I would give you, uh, sorry. But there is one not so secret formula that I know, and that is to do great work. Great work is incredibly hard. There is no shortcuts. You've got to practice, and you've got to practice every single day, knowing that at times you're going to suck, <laughs> right? You're going to fail. You're not going to get it right. But you get up, and you just you do it better next time. And that's the process. You just got to you've got to get, repeat it over and over and over again. So I, I want to talk about how these guys influenced my work, and I'm just going to touch on this just a little bit. Going back to Mies van der Rohe, Mies was the master of details. His work was just phenomenal in, in the way he put things together. It first starts 
with understanding the materials that you're working with. He would first figure out what kind of materials you wanted to work with, and then he knew the limitations of those materials. For instance, this travertine stone. He knew that the, you couldn't get a piece of travertine stone more than, say, this size, right? And he'd base his whole design off of that pattern of materials so that every column in the house, every wall aligned absolutely perfect with these joints. Now you might say that's overkill and you might say like, why in the world would you do that? It makes all the difference in the world when you visit a place that, that has that attention to detail. Like I said earlier, you can feel it. You can literally feel the difference when you arrive at a place that has that much purpose and that much quality. So here's a project that we're working on up in the avenues. It's a high-end residential project. Uh, our client is, owns an art gallery here in Utah. Uh, she has some of the most amazing taste in art. And we have got brought on the project with the architect and we started discussing, you know, what we wanted this place to be. And she is a huge fan of modern art and contemporary uh, art. And so early on in the process, this house started to get kind of Miesian, <laughs> right? It started to have a lot of things that I think Mies would be doing. And so we tried to apply, we're trying to apply some of those principles that I learned from studying Mies is, tr you know, early on we identified what the materials were on the house and we said, what if we were to pull that into our landscape? And so if you can see in this SketchUp model, because it helps us see the lines a little easier, is we're trying to align all the joints in the paving and everything perfectly with the walls of the house and the windows and so forth. This is extremely difficult to do, <laughs> um, but we're doing it. And I think it's gonna make all the difference in the world. Another project, um, having got the opportunity to work with one of my heroes. So we're working with Tom Kundig on this house, or on this uh, building um, up in, it's called Marcella. It's a private ski lodge on the backside of Deer Valley. And it's been an amazing project. We were brought on a little later than I'd like, uh, meaning the architects had already kind of started to conceptualize the building footprint, and they already started kind of rotating the building to get the views and stuff that they, they wanted before we were even brought on the project. So typically we like to be the ones, the first, first ones on the floor, and we're the ones dictating where the building goes and how to orient it, but unfortunately we were brought on a little late. So we kind of had to work with this. So there's a, there's a significant amount of grade change across this. I think there's like 30, 40 feet of grade change. Grade change. And there's obviously with all buildings, there's a, a large programming element to this. Uh, we have to provide parking. We have to provide a pickleball court. We have to provide outdoor seating areas. We have to provide areas for hot tubs and so forth. And how do you do that? with the least amount of moves possible is what we kind of gave that charge to ourselves is we want to be light on the land. You can see that they scraped this obviously for construction, but this is up in the mountains, right? And so we want to put the landscape back in here as if um, this building just fell from the sky. So how do you do this with the least amount of moves possible? So we started to identify where the parking goes, where pickleball might occur, where the patios and so forth might occur, um, where the landscape starts to eat its way in, uh, where the hot tub and fire pits and all those kind of amenities start to appear. And like I mentioned, this is on the backside of Deer Valley. So we wanna take the aspen trees and the conifers, we wanna put them back on the site as if they were always there and that we never scraped it um, and make it feel as though the building just kind of fell from the sky. Um, so that was the process that we went through and we meet with the architects, we meet with the interior designers, and we meet with them almost every, uh, every week. And there's a lot of designers in the room. <laughs> and they're all making comments of like, what if we did this, what if we did that? 
And we, we were trying to respond to everybody and things started getting a little messy, right? Things started changing and we started changing walls and just things got a little messy. So we went back to the drawing board and we said, okay, let's, let's rethink this again. There's an interesting kind of yin and yang slash counterbalance thing going on with the architecture. What can we do with the least amount of moves possible um, to make a difference? And that's where Ando comes into play. Ando is the master of simplicity, like I said. He's the master of doing the least amount of moves possible to make the biggest impact. And as you can see through this, through these images, it's just all about ge geometry and simple, simple, simple moves. So we said, let's ando this, right? Let's, let's just, let, what would ando do, <laughs> right? So we just said, let's just strike a line through the middle and let that be the, the thing that really drives our whole design. So that's what we did. Now, the thing I wanna kind of end with, um, and there's still a lot to go through here, but we are all products of our environment. All of us in this room are indeed influenced by our surroundings. Years ago, here, I'm gonna take a drink real quick. This might make me jittery, sorry, but <laughs> my mouth is dry. Years ago, I listened to a talk where the speaker spoke of what he called the belief window. And he says this, he says, all of us, since the day we were born, have a, an imaginary window that sits in front of our face. And it's about this big. In our entire lives, we're looking through this window and we're taking in information through this window. And that information then becomes our beliefs. And our beliefs then dictate our behavior. I honestly believe this is true, right? We are what we take in. Our actions are a byproduct of what we surround ourselves with. I'm gonna give you some examples. There are, there are those that might believe that all dogs are vicious, okay? Do you think there's people out there that have that etched on their belief window? All dogs are vicious, okay? If that's true then, if that person really believes it and they're walking down the street and a dog starts to approach them, what are they gonna do, right? They're gonna, they're gonna freeze up, they're gonna run, they're gonna whatever, right? Okay, I'm gonna give you another example. Um, there are those of us that believe, I noticed that I said those of us, that believe that all European cars are better, okay? <laughs> I do own a Ford truck, but all of my other cars are European. So there's, there are those of us that believe all European cars are better, right? If that's true, if that's what that individual has etched on their belief window, what are they gonna do when they go to buy a car, right? They're gonna buy a European car because that's what's etched on their window, okay? So the things that we take in through our belief window um, and through our window, the things that we observe actually dictate our behavior. One more, one more example. There's a man who walks into the kitchen and his wife's preparing dinner and she has a ham. Uh, she's preparing a ham for dinner and he notices that while she's preparing this ham, she cuts the ends off the ham, right? And he was kind of perplexed by this and he's like, why did you do that? Why did you cut the ends off your ham? And his wife responds and says, it makes it taste better. And he's like, what? <laughs> what? Why, why does cutting off the ends of the ham make it taste better? Where did you hear that? And she responds, my mom told me that. So that night, the mom comes over to the house and he asks her, I understand you cut the ends off your ham. She's like, I do. <laughs> why do you do that? It makes it taste better. Who told you that? My mom told me that. 
this guy was bugged, right? He's like, this is so weird. So he goes to the phone, he calls the grandma who's still alive, three generations now, right? He calls the grandma and he's like, I understand that you cut the ends off your ham. And she's like, I do. And he's like, why do you do that? And she said, it doesn't fit in my oven if I don't. <laughs> okay? So think about that for a minute. Let me find my notes here. I want you to think about that for a minute, okay? What we believe determines what we do. And there are times where there's good behavior and bad behavior, right? We as people often repeat bad behavior over and over again. We repeat it over and over again because that's all we know. Okay? Sorry, should have got that into the pig, pig comment. Yeah. I live in Bountiful. Some of these guys do too. This is a pattern that's being repeated in Bountiful over and over again. And you could argue, I'm talking specifically of the retaining wall, right? You could argue that Bountiful has a, an enormous amount of grade change, and this is a very inexpensive way to retain is to use boulders. But this is being repeated over and over and over again to the point where it's like Bountiful's main aesthetic, okay? There's better ways to do this, okay? But it gets repeated over and over again. Do we find this in our, in our landscapes where things just get repeated over and over and over again? Unfortunately, this is happening from people who are Businessmen, these are people who went to school in business or they're contractors that are doing this over and over again. They are not designers. They did not learn how to see how to do this better, right? But we repeat it because that's all we know. You see your neighbor do it and you're like, oh, I kind of like that because you've never been seen, you know, you've never seen anything else. So you just repeat what they did, right? Playgrounds, where, where would you rather live? Here, where it's all about the automobile. It's all about garage doors. There's actually even no sidewalk. Look at the amount of curb cuts that there are on the street. Would you rather live there, or would you rather live here, where there's no curb cuts because now we've pushed the garages in the back. We've provided alleyways to the back. We've provided porches up front where people could come out and interact with other people that are walking by, where would you rather live? Playgrounds, would you rather have this? Or would you rather playgrounds look more like that? And this is kind of an interesting pattern. We're starting to work in a little town called Hoytsville. Many of you might not know where that's at. Hoytsville is by Colville, um, teeny unincorporated community in Utah. And it's been interesting, we're starting to do some work there. And this is a pattern that we're starting to see, for good or for bad. We actually like it. It's actually starting because it's kind of their vernacular. Um, you see these fences everywhere. Everyone, everywhere in Hoytsville has this fence. It's really weird, and they kind of done these different adaptations of it. Um, but we're actually thinking about using this as as a design aesthetic in the, some of the things that we do, uh, because it's become kind of their pattern. And that's kind of how things were, right? Before, before we could travel and before the internet, every little town kind of had their own little vernacular because we copy each other. Um, so here's the, here's the thing. If our environments actually have the ability to influence behavior, who creates the environment? We do. We have an incredible opportunity as landscape architects to create change. We have, I mean, I can't even begin to even like emphasize this point. We have an enormous opportunity to make a difference. Okay, sorry. Um, I just wanna talk about this really quickly. Um, if there was a, there's no bigger ham than this, okay? And what I mean by that is, this is our Utah landscape, right? Every house in Utah, not every house obviously, but the majority of homes in Utah look like these images, right? And there's nothing, I mean, there, some of them's really nice, right? But the problem is, is that 
Utah, we're, we are all immigrants to Utah. Every one of us that have come here came from somewhere else. And early on, the majority of the immigrants that came here came from the East Coast and came from England. And there's no bigger ham, if you will, than the statement, let's, let's, uh, let's make the desert bloom like a rose, right? Or something like that. Remember, have we all heard that? Brigham Young made the comment, something, let's make the desert blossom like a rose. Think about what he's really saying there. Let's alter the desert to be an English garden, is what he's saying, right? And we've learned we can't do that anymore, right? The Great Salt Lake is drying up. Um, New York Times has been putting out articles talking about this very issue. And so we can't, we can't repeat that bad behavior anymore. And we as landscape architects are at the forefront. We're, we're the ones leading the charge on what we can do different. This is our landscape. This is what surrounds us. Could, can we take this kind of landscape and put it around our designs, right? Um, this is our charge, in my opinion, moving forward. Is we as landscape architects need to find a way to educate our, our communities that this is a better way. We've had success with this. This is the Natural History Museum up at the uh, University of Utah. This won a, a national award uh, for excellence. Um, what if we were to do this at a grander scale? This is what we're trying to do at a, new, a project of ours. It's called Wood Ranch. It's at the base of the Ochre Mountains. We're working with a client right now that has 300 acres where they're wanting to do a master plan development. And it's at the foothills of the Ochres. And we said, look it, we can't keep doing the same things we're, we've been doing all these years. We've got we've to make a change. And we started trying to educate our client that this was the better route to go. To the credit of the client, the client's yes. It was like, yes, we're all in. Let's do it. Let's make this the statement of this new community. Let's, let's let the landscape be the new, um, the new statement. And this, is, this has been actually a really difficult um, project. Um, this is Dave Anderson's front yard, by the way. Yeah. yeah. We need to start doing more of this, right? Dave's probably cringing. He's probably like seeing things. Oh, I need to go weed that or whatever. But, but this, is, this is the route we need to go, right? We need to start thinking more water-wise. This is not easy to do. And it's, it's, a, it's a huge dilemma here in Utah. And I'll tell you why. As, we've, as we started to identify the plants that pull this off, right, that allow us to do something like this, we made a huge list. We want to do this. We want to plant this, 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 this. And we went to the growers and we said, look at, we're doing this big master plan community. We need these plants. And what do you think they told us? We don't have it. We don't have these plants. We're like, what do you mean? These are Utah natives, right? Or these are plants that do really well here in Utah. Why don't you have these plants? What do you think the answer was? There's no demand. Everyone wants to do the English garden, right? So that's the dilemma that we have. So here's our charge as landscape architects, in my opinion, is we need to start creating the demand, okay? And I feel very fortunate that we have several clients that are allowing us to do this at a very, very large scale. So we're trying to do this at the 300 acre scale we have another client that has a couple other projects that are in the 2,000, 3,000 acre scale. Now we have the, the backing to go to these growers and say, look it, we're about to embark on a master plan that's gonna take 10, 15, 20 years to build out. If we give you the demand, will you grow for us? And they're like, you bet. We've been wanting to do this all along, right? So we have an opportunity to make real change here. So, you know, I'm going to go through this quickly. So we're developing plant lists and planting plans, colors by the seasons, you know, all the good stuff. Um, 
trying to get our clients to buy off on it. The other thing that's interesting about this process though that we're learning is it takes a whole different way of maintaining it, right? Which is a whole nother level of complexity. It's not just the mow and blow, right? That landscape crews are used to doing is just going out there and just hurry up, hurry up and get it done. Um, so it's a whole educational process of like working with the people that are gonna be maintaining this and trying to get them on the same page. So here are some just quick renderings of what, what, what that takes, okay? So, <clears throat> let me just jump through here real quick. Sorry if I'm boring all of you to death here. Um, there's a phrase that we often use that I find is kind of interesting. We often say this phrase um, when we're talking about events. When an event occurs, we often say, it takes place or it took place. And what is, that, what is that really saying? It means that the event took place in an actual location, right? That that event, that the place itself had to be able to accommodate that event. Does that make sense? So the events of our life actually take place in physical locations. And these locations are designed by us. If you think about that for a minute, we are the creators of place, okay? We're the ones creating the place for our lives to play out on. I'm gonna give you an example. I wish I would have had the opportunity to go take a picture of this, but this is a, this is a project that we did called Heights Park. And one of the individuals in the community called me up one day and said, Mike, I wish I would have taken a picture of this, of this for you, but last night, um, I drove past Heights Park and there was an enormous table on the top of that hill that had a white linen cloth and candlelight and so forth. And a group of kids had their prom dinner on top of the hill, right? And I know that's like a little thing, but how awesome is that, right? Our, the, the events of our lives take, take place in a location. These kids are, those kids are gonna remember that their whole lives, right? And it took place in a, a, a design that we had an opportunity to play a part in. Um, here's another one I just threw in real quick. This is a plaza that we designed for a client uh, up in Deer Valley. And we knew that there was gonna be events that took place in here. Obviously it's a plaza, like, so we scaled it appropriately to the, the amount of people that we thought. But what we're starting to find is that they're starting to have an enormous amount of weddings in this plaza. And it's just, it's just, it's kind of fun to think that our design is starting to have an impact and play a part in people's memories of what they've, what they're experiencing. Now, this is, this is the thing I want to just, um, I know we're going over time. Um, this is my favorite quote of all time. I used to have this quote pinned up next to my door or next to my desk at, uh, in, when I was at Design Workshop. Now the great function of a place is to permit and be, indeed encourage and entice the greatest possible number of meetings, encounters, challenges between pe persons, classes, and groups, providing as it were a stage upon which the drama of social life may be enacted with the actors taking place, taking turns as spectators and the spec spectators as actors. I absolutely love this, because to, to dissect it and kind of break it down, the purpose of place, and that's what loci means by the way, loci means places, the purpose of place is to encourage the greatest number of encounters between people and provide a stage upon which life may occur. We are the stage designers. We're the ones designing the stage for life to take place on. I would love to go down to the stage. I think there's a stage design class here at Utah State. I would love to go down to them and say, look at you guys are designing stages that are 30 feet by 60 feet. We're designing the stage, right? We could probably learn a lot from those guys though on how to create place. So, here are some of the areas that we at LOSI 
are trying to aim to influence. It's in our, lo it's in our title. LOCI is trying to aim and, and influence areas of landscape architecture, land planning, and urban design. And I'm just gonna go through this really quickly because we're over time. Here's some of the stages that we've been designing over the years um, in these areas. And I've got a lot, so I'm just gonna keep going. Talk about stage, right? Talking about, we didn't plan for this. This is, uh, this is the boat, we call it the boathouse. It's a little harbor out at daybreak where we've had the opportunity to do some designing of this area. And every Friday night they, they hold these dance classes um, out there. We literally provided a stage for this to happen, right? This is that little plaza that's starting to become the wedding venue up at Deer Valley. Yeah, that's good. Tell a story about this, but I won't. <laughs> Here's an example, I think. I'll stop on this one for a second. Of trying to get away from that Utah landscape, right? Large expanse of turf. Get, don't get me wrong, there is a large expanse of turf on this project. It could have been a lot more, but we tried to influence the client to let us to do, allow us to do more native and natural uh, plantings where it looks as though the landscape that's up in the mountain just spills um, into the, the property. Here's another view of it. Stage. <laughs> Land planning. This is that project I was telling you about, Wood Ranch, where we're wanting to do all uh, native plantings. Some things at really large scale. Urban design, several of you know this project, Station Center, right, that you guys are working on right now? Um, the Rio Grande. I'm just gonna keep going. The last thing I wanna just close with is another very, very important area to get influence from is other people. You're only good, you're, I'm just slaughtering every one of these. <laughs> you're only good, <laughs> I'm tired, I should just give up. You guys can read it. No, <laughs> David, do you, wanna, do you wanna say it? Okay. You're only going to be as good as the people you surround yourself with. That's all that needs to be said. <laughs> Todd Johnson, you guys all know Todd. Wish he would have been able to be here today, but um, when I was at Design Workshop, and I don't even know what project I was working on, or I don't even remember the content, but Todd Johnson told me, I, I was probably complaining, I was probably complaining about a project, and he pulled me aside and he said, Mike, if you wanna be the best, you need to surround yourself with the best. And that has had an absolute huge impact in my life, especially as I eventually became a business owner, starting to try to start my own firm. If you wanna be the best, you need to surround yourself with the best. And I'm here to tell you, I've got the best. And uh, none of that stuff that you've seen is possible without all of these individuals. And it's true with you guys. If you wanna be the best, surround yourself with people who are better than you, who are smarter than you, who know how to do it. I, play, I know it doesn't look like it, but I used to play a lot of sports when I was younger. Um, and my coach always used to say that in basketball. He would say, if you wanna be a better basketball player, you go play people who are better than you. And they're gonna do nothing but just elevate your game. Right? And that, in my opinion, is key to this profession. Not only do you surround yourself with people who are better you, than you in your office, but when you want to do your best work 
and projects, you need to surround yourself with the best consultants, sub-consultants. Bring on the best civil engineers. Who are the best structural engineers? Who are the best architects? Surround yourself with those who are better than you, and it's going to do nothing but just elevate your game to a whole other level. So, in closing, if I can remember all the things we talked about, <laughs> you first have to get inspired. You have to be influenced by something. Take that influence, apply it to your work, use that work to influence others, surround yourself with people who are better than you, and then go out and create stages for, for which life can perform. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. We are now going to invite our department head, Keith Christensen, up to say a few words. Do you want this? Uh, sure. Yeah, you do. No flowers? No. Um, and I wish this had YouTube tickets in it for you. But, <laughs> no kidding, uh, man. It's not. We wanted to broaden your window so there's Taylor Swift tickets in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I need yeah. to expand my influence a little That's more. That's right. Think, yeah. no. Just or not my <laughs> influence, but I need to, yeah. Yeah, yeah everyone's. So, yeah. Well, on, on behalf of the Department of Landscape Architecture, we're, I can speak for everyone in saying we're very grateful to be under your influence. So yeah, thank it. you for, uh, for being such a wonderful example of the, the best of LEP. We appreciate you. Thanks, thank man. you. Appreciate it. Thank you.